Welcome back to The Point with Mick Rich. Hey, it's great being back in the studio. This week I went traveling uh, through the land of enchantment. And what a great time Marion and I had. We took off in our RV. We headed over to, uh, towards Grants, just before Grants. We headed south over to, uh, down towards Silver City. Saw some beautiful country. Went from uh, valleys up to mountaintops and ridges. It was gorgeous, and as you can see in this photo, just a beautiful spot to pull off to the side to go camping. And it was, you know, that's why we talk about New Mexico, the land of enchantment, and it is in that spot. We were right around, it was still a little bit windy, but just plain gorgeous. Saw some, plenty of livestock, plenty of uh, cattle out there, but man, oh man, there was snow, there was mud. Uh, I looked like a hero to my, my, to my wife that I got us through that un, unscathed. And, but, so I want to just touch base with that. And next week I'm going to talk about where we went and some of the things that we saw. But I want to talk a little bit further about follow through on last week's program. But it also ties in with what's going on in the roundhouse. But here I am, I'm going through, getting prepared for the program, and I ran across an article and it was from Money Wise Magazine, article listed, the worst 16 states to retire in. New Mexico is listed number eight, worst states. And they're going through and they're talking about the natural beauty, the clear skies. That's what Marion and I saw. That's what we enjoyed. But what this, this article talked about was crime. That's what we talked about last week. And here it is. And what are our elected officials doing in Santa Fe to take a bite out of crime. Remember that, you know, Deputy Dog or whatever his name was? Take a bite out of crime. What are they doing? Governor Lujan's strategy to stop criminals before they are born with abortion up to point of delivery. And, and, I, and I make this tongue in cheek, but this is what's killing our state. This is what's killing the citizens of New Mexico. And what's the governor doing? She's focusing on abortion. Uh, I, I can't help but wonder if she's up there thinking, God, if I could only identify those criminals while they're still in the womb, we can eliminate those criminals, future criminals. And then speak, Speaker Egoff's strategy to stop criminals before they get off their living room couches with legalized marijuana. I can imagine that he's thinking, if we can just get the criminals to smoke some more dope, in order pizza delivery, they'll be too mellow and too slow to kill our citizens. And it's awful, but what are they doing? And then Senate uh, Pro Tem Stewart, her strategy to stop criminals with high energy prices, and that is that, that New Mexico citizens are not going to have any disposable income other than, you know, after they pay their heating bills and they put gas in their tanks. This is what's going on in our state. Meanwhile, the Mexico District Attorney and State Attorney General are releasing re arrested criminals back onto the street in New Mexico. You know, it, you can't make it up. And, and we're, we're at the worst for crime if they're not addressing crime. I joke about it, because if I didn't joke about it, you know, I'd cry. But there are families out there, mothers and fathers crying over lost sons and daughters. It's not a laughing matter. You know, what is Governor Lujan, Speaker Egoff, Senate Pro Tem Stewart? They're not doing a darn thing. And, and last week we talked about Jackson, one of the, the baseball player from Texas, came out here to play baseball, a bright star. And Damon Basher is charged with the murder of Jackson Weller. And I say, you know, charged with murder, but really charged with the assassination of Jackson Weller. And, you know, he may have pulled the trigger, and, and there's court proceedings, we'll find out if he's found guilty. But Michelle Lujan Grisham, Brian Egoff, 
Mimi Stewart are responsible for failing to enact laws to keep violent criminals off our streets. Bernalillo District Attorney Ra yeah, Raul Torres, he was elected to ensure that equal justice for all of us, not just for the criminals. And what does he do? He points to APD and said they failed and gave the info to us, and so we couldn't do our job. And then what about the district judge? That was Judge Brown was asked, you know, what happened? And he pointed to the district attorney and said they, they failed to follow, follow through. What can I do? I don't know. I haven't got, you know, I've gone before a few judges over traffic tickets, and that's been about it. Uh, but we all understand that when judges get up there on the bench, they are, they are like, uh, they have the say, they have the word. And they make it clear to everybody in the room, they have the say. When it goes down the toilet and they release a violent criminal that goes out and kills a bright star in our community, they go, not our fault, our hands were tied. This is unacceptable. In 2015, Chief Justice Charles Daniel advocated for bail bond reform, and then he retired a few years later. What's the current Chief Justice Michael Vigil? What is he doing to advocate changes to keep violent criminals behind bars while they're awaiting trial? I'm not saying to put innocent people behind bars, but I'm saying is these violent criminals are being arrested, they're cycling through the court system. They get back out on the street and they intimidate the witnesses. And it's happening over and over. Who wants to testify against a murder knowing full well that they could be coming after you or your family members? And I have to say that the political elites got it down. I went to a luncheon a number, quite a few years ago and I couldn't believe, I, I was not surprised when the mayor got up there, not our current mayor, got up there and said to everybody in the room, the crime stats have gone down, but it sure doesn't feel that way. That is a standard protocol. I think even Hollywood uses those lines. The stats are one way, but we're going to acknowledge the feelings the other way, as if it's going to make it all okay if they can skate by with that. Guess what? It doesn't get them off the hook. It doesn't make it okay. And it's up to us. So what about equal justice for Jackson Weller? Damon Basher has not been convicted, convicted, and it's coming now up to two years. Remember we've read, you know, God, that was in shows, right? Justice delayed is justice denied. New Mexico presented Jackson Weller's family with a UNM diploma. Little Consola nowhere near makes up the loss of a son. Any parent that has lost a son or daughter wants justice for their child and they want to make sure that their child did not die in vain. We need to decide not another Jackson Weller. And the other part that's just amazing to me is that the Albuquerque Journal didn't list any of the names of the other victims of, of uh, Damon Basher. Why not? Well, there, are they minorities because, and they're inconsequential or they're low, low income individuals, so they're inconsequential? Well, they're not. They're just as precious. They are somebody's son and daughter as well. So we need to think about it. What are we going to do about it? Four years ago, while I was attending a border task force conference in Deming, the congressman staffer, chief of staff was there, and people are, are standing up and saying, it's not right, we are being overrun with sex traffickers, human traffickers, drug traffickers, we need to do something about it. And it was amazed me to see that the congressman staffer said to everybody in the room, what you need to do is protest loud enough so your voice is heard in Washington. And I'm thinking, that's what we, we got you. But guess what? 
That's what we're going to have to do. That's what you're going to have to do. We are going to have to protest loud enough. So Governor Lujan Grisham up in Santa Fe and President Biden in Washington understand that this is unacceptable, that it's got to change, and they work for us. We don't work for them. And this is why it's clear to me that what we have is a political elite class dictating how we're supposed to live our lives, and they live it completely differently. Do you want? I can understand why they have put barricades around the Roundhouse. I understand why they have put barricades around Washington, why they have the National Guard there, because they understand if we did to them what they're doing to us, we would burn it down. We're not going to do it. I don't advocate for that, but I'm making it clear to everybody that we're going to get, have to get out there and protest and make it loud because this is unacceptable. Thanks for tuning in. This is the first section to the point with Mick Rich. Thank you. team in the playoffs. It's picked off. Nothing but green in front. Touchdown, Monsanto. Um, hope it warms up a little. <laughs> Roland looking. He's got some daylight in front of him at the 10, the 5. He's going to go into the end zone for the touchdown. yards like that. The sides of Chavez in motion. Javier fires down the middle and it's Rodriguez to the five and he's in. Touchdown. Going in the end zone. Ball is caught. Touchdown Cowboys. Joseph, look out, and he's gone. Forget about it. LaShawn Joseph with a house call. Touchdown, Sandia. The winner gets to take with them, or in Western's case, keep it here. Giselle Price will return. Catches it on the goal line. Price has got a little crease. One man to beat. Price might be gone. Price is in the open field and will score on a 98-yard kickoff return. Is El Price at Eastern New Mexico 32-yard line? Fowler in the gun, pump fake to Colson. He's got him open. Colson with the move at the 10. He'll go in for the touchdown. 32-yard touchdown pass. Malik comes out wide to the left this time on second down and 10. They're going to throw it out to him. Up the sideline, he goes! Malik is off to the racing. Ain't nobody going to catch him. It's 6-0, the Clovis Wildcats. It's been a touchdown, but in any event, it's fourth and 10. Roland looking, throws it out, incomplete. Ball will go over on downs with a minute 11 to go. And for the first time this year, the Mexico Highlands will be in the victory position, victory kneel down position. And look at this shot out of a cannon. All the way is Gallegos for his third Touchdown tonight.
Thanks for tuning in to The Point with Mick Rich. These, this segment and the next one, I want to talk about education. Uh, it's important to me. I've been an advocate for education. I have helped start one of the first vocational charter high schools in Albuquerque years ago. I helped start a with a number of contractors. I didn't do it when I say I helped. I helped. I didn't stand on the sidelines. I participated. I helped start a number of uh, apprenticeship programs in the state, and I'm glad to say that we've made a difference. I help make a difference in our state when it comes to education. Uh, Marion and our, uh, our kids, they've gone to public school, they've gone to charter schools, they've gone to Catholic schools. So we've had a wide range of experiences in the, in the city when it comes to education. Uh, also, I want you to know that I reached out to the president of the APS board and invited him to come on the program, uh, President Dr. David Percy. And they made it, the first time I guess they said, oh, we're going to take a look at the schedule, and I understand that. Hey, thanks. They got back to me. Most people don't get back to me. Then they got back, and it was like, whoa, there's no way. We're, they didn't come out and say it, but it was clear. Uh, it's not going to work today. It's not going to work tomorrow. It won't work ever. Uh, but feel free to reach back to us, and maybe something will change. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been there. I've done sales calls. I know what that's like. Uh, but I think it's important that we reach out to our uh, people in, in power and ask them to come on the program, sit next to me and say, hey, you know, go, you know, the old saying, mano a mano. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. Every governor, since I, I've been here for 40 years, every governor, when they get sworn in, they are going to make education a priority. And I'm thinking, if they all make education a priority, how are we still at the bottom? And we are. And here it is, New Mexico pro tem Mimi, Mimi Stewart, had a great article in the paper, and it said, you know, she's a retired educator. She served in the House and Senate for 25 years. She's made education a priority. And I, and I thought, and she's bragging about it, education is my number one, you know, priority. And I'm thinking, Mimi, you've been doing this for 25 years. Whatever you're doing, stop. Make it a, di pick a different priority. Me, Maybe if you make crime a priority, that'll change. But, but whatever you're doing, you're keeping us at the bottom. And, and it amazes me that I would quit if I kept building buildings that fell down after the first one, I would quit. I mean, really, it's just, it, 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 I just, it, it is amazing to me. And then to brag about it, that uh, I have had failures for 25 years and I keep doing it. So I want to first talk about how do, outside New Mexico, how do they rank education? In Education Week magazine parameters are high school graduation rates, advanced placement exam results, school finance, uh, that has to do with college. Uh, pre-K enrollment. U.S. News and World Report parameters are higher education, uh, graduation rate, college debt, tuition costs, and then pre-K and K through 12 has to do with pre-K enrollment, standardized tests and scores, uh, public high school graduation rate, Forbes uh, college attainment, uh, National Education Association, I thought was interesting, the uh, National Education Association, really the teachers groups, the unions, uh, they're all about how much are you paying our teachers, how much are you paying the staffers, how much are you putting into education, and it's really about money spent, not about results. The conclusion that I, I came up with is that we should ignore non-measurable means to rating our education system. Money paid to teachers, money paid to all these other things 
to you what, to me is nonsensical. Pre-K, great. They say pre-K is going to work. We're putting the same people in charge of pre-K as we put in through in charge of K through 12. That's a disaster. Tell you what, we don't let them touch anything new until they fix what they've got. That's my, you know, that's my means. I don't ever, in my business, somebody that's a disaster over here, I don't give them more responsibility. Uh, that, that's just a means for ending your business. Uh, what we should do, and I thought about it, is we should enact a ma measurable means for rating our education system. High school graduation rates and proficiency of high school graduates. And that has to do, so that's number one. Then the other one, college students' rates of remedial colleges, college classes. So when our high school graduates go to universities, you know, how many of them are prepared to start right off in taking the college courses or they having to take remedial? That is a, a reasonable measure. Standardized test scores. You know, you look at it, I'm saying, if we're scoring a 30 40% proficiency, I think we have a problem. I don't think you can say, well, you know, the others, we should be at proficiency, not, not at 30%. Rate of college attendance, but also at the same time, rates of vocational education attendance. Those, to me, are important. Then the question I looked at, and this took a while to sort through, it, it wasn't easy. How do they rate college education spending? Which I thought was interesting. New Mexico ranks overall spending per student. We're in about the middle of the pack. At the same time, New Mexico ranking for teacher pay is near the bottom. But what I did was, I said, okay, this is kind of interesting. How... Okay, and then I tied in with is, uh, what's our standard cost of living? Cost of living is at the bottom. Our teacher pay is at the bottom. So they kind of tie in. If you've got a high, if you're at the t top of pay and you're at the top of cost of living, well, it doesn't make any difference. We don't pay our police officers based in Albuquerque, or I should say around rural New Mexico, based on what they pay in San Francisco or LA. That doesn't make any sense. We don't do that, we shouldn't do it with our teacher. So what we should do is, that I looked at it, I said New Mexico is spending on education is about appropriate. It appears that our administrative costs are, are high. It looks like to me New Mexico New Mexico is not spending men, money where it makes a difference. Think about it. You know, how did I judge how, how that kind of looks? And, and what I came up with is that if the teacher pay is about in line and cost per student is about in line, and the student ratio is about in line, but we're paying a pair of, a chunk of change. I'm saying I think it's out of, out of sync. And take a look at, just look at APS. They have the Twin Towers of Power right there in Uptown. And uh, I, at one time, that was Class A office space. It's probably B plus now. But... This is the priority. Look at some of the training facilities up in the Northeast Heights. God, just gorgeous facilities. Private enterprise can't afford that. So what I looked at was that we need to make that change. We need to figure out where we're putting money. The other item is what we should also be doing at the same time is do social, move the social effort from counties and cities into the schools and tie that all together. So the teachers, the administration focus on teaching and we have personnel in the school to help our students to get through. Somebody that's gonna make sure those students don't follow through, whether it's violence at home, sex abuse at home, whether they have so, to know that somebody cares about them, not just their teachers. 
these are the things that I saw that were going to be important to do. And then those are the things. The other one is school board control. And, and one of them I decided was I looked at it, and I looked at APS. Why APS? Number one, it's the biggest school district in the state. It's huge compared to other districts in the country. Uh, and then it, it's kind of interesting. So number one is they decide the school salaries. They decide the administrative levels. They decide spending level. This is all the school board. Remember, the president doesn't. This is why the president didn't want to come on the program, because he doesn't want to be asked. They decide the curriculum. They decide the quality of facilities. And how are they doing? Teacher salaries are in the middle of the pack. Remember we said state, at, state, state salaries are about at the bottom. APS, we're in the middle of the pack for the whole country. The twin power, twin towers of power in Uptown. Cost per student is near the top of the states. It is a progressive agenda. When I say it's a progressive agenda, think about it is when our kids went to school they could not give, the schools couldn't give my kids aspirin, but they can, they can hand down birth control to students without parent consent. Our, the quality of the school facilities rival those of UNM, higher education, and student success rate is at the bottom. This is what's going on. This is what drives, this is why I have the program. This is what I'm bringing to you. This is why they won't come on our program. So real quick, to wrap it up, conclusion, administrators are doing quite well financially. Teachers are doing quite well financially. Parents are suffering, students are being cheated. Teacher union are the big winners. Top wages, top facilities, lion's share of the public spending, override parents and no accountability. Parents have lost control of their students, their children's education and our children are being indoctrinated, not taught. This is Mick Rich. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Don't sacrifice quality of flavor when you're in a hurry. Golden Pride offers ribs, fried chicken, green and red chili breakfast burritos, and Frontier Cinnabons. Four great locations or visit us online at goldenpride.abq.com. Golden Pride barbecue chicken and ribs proud supporter of Provia Sports Network. Calling all football players. Are you looking to develop your skills this season? It's never too late or too early to put in the work. Coach Carl Barrer and the Air Barrer program at 8 Grady's Performance Center provide comprehensive position training for aspiring football players at all levels. Whether you're looking to increase your speed, gain strength, or hone your skill, we train all positions with a team of experienced coaches who know what it takes to succeed at all levels from Yaffle to college. Check us out at 8gradies.com to learn more and sign up for training today. Sadie's is a proud supporter of New Mexico high school sports and athletics, and we here at ProView Networks would like to thank Sadie's for their continued support in helping us bring you all of your New Mexico high school sports coverage. Well, I'm going to the frontier, walk to the cashier, order up a root beer and a number one. Cover it with green stuff, one scoop is not enough. Find a booth is real tough, back by the Duke. Meet my family, meet my friends in the quirkiest restaurant I have ever been. All of Albuquerque's favorite spot, it's the Frontier Restaurant. The Frontier Restaurant is a proud supporter of ProView Networks. is a proud supporter of ProView Networks. Thanks for tuning back in to, to The Point with Mick Rich. Uh, I'm a firm believer, and I've, you've heard me talk about it before, is that when an event occurs or I analyze things, 
that allow us to take a look at what's going on in our state, our country, even in my business. And I look at extremes. And sometimes that it's, it's clear, uh, floods are an extreme, makes you look at what's going on. Uh, the COVID-19 educational crisis, this to me is, offers a window in our educational system, unlike any that we've seen before. It allows us to step back and see what's going on. This is, this is a, they're saying, oh, it's an anomaly, but it really allows us to look at our education system under stress. And remember, uh, we all have stress tests. When we get physical, sometimes those are stress tests. They want to know how our body handles uh, stress and is there some problems associated with it. Well, the same thing's true with education. When we're at the bottom of the pack, we're in the bottom of the bottom, you know, and, and we've heard it over and over, oh, thank God for Mississippi or thank God for Nevada that we're not at the very bottom. I think Martin Heinrich wants to bring in uh, Puerto Rico into one of the states, so we can now say, thank God we're not Puerto Rico. Uh, that's no reason to bring a state into the union. They need to be adding and contributing to the, our, our country, not, not you know, bringing the curve down, being the outlier. Uh, and that's what New Mexico is. We bring the curve down for everybody else. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about this. So in my business, uh, we give DISC, we do DISC assessments of our staff. I've done DISC assessments on me. DISC stands for dominance, uh, you know, are you, uh, you know, yeah, are you a cha uh, take charge type guy? You can well imagine that's me. Uh, influence. Uh, you know, I'm up here. I, I, I don't have a problem, man, front and center. Steadiness, uh, conscientiousness, uh, you know, it's interesting. I'm always interested to see how I do on those, on those, on those uh, analysis. Uh, there's no right or wrong way, but it is interesting to, to understand where you're coming from, understand where other people are coming from. In meetings, I make a point that if I know where people are, the, the people that are the introverts, the more uh, uh, that, that are the opposite of dominance or influencers, that to make sure to ask them for their opinion. And then lastly, there's a part in there that says this is your, uh, your adaptive, how you adjust so you don't, so I don't run over people. <laughs> you know, that, that becomes very important. So I make sure that I don't run over people. That's my adaptive side. The other one is the natural. Well, guess what? Under stress, it goes to natural. When there's a crisis, it's not like uh, I want to make sure everybody's okay and we're all, I'm saying we're going to make sure the building doesn't fall down. Uh, or like over the weekend was, I took over, my, Marion drove on some pretty, you know, pretty exciting roads. Uh, uh, I took over when it was, uh, it was, it was, got pretty hairy and uh, it got pretty ugly and we got through the steep grades, the tight turns, the snow, the mud, and that's what we're talking about. But here we're going to talk about the COVID-19 crisis on what it looks like. Many New Mexico Many non-public schools remained open, while well, many public schools remained closed. And what surprised me was that you didn't see spikes in the Catholic schools where we had to shut them down. They didn't. They continued operating, but the public schools stayed closed. Many teachers union voted to keep their schools closed. Their teachers didn't want to go back to school. They're getting a full paycheck. The unions are getting all their dues. They're getting their money. Uh, parents are demanding for schools to be opened. Schools, uh, students want to get back to school. They want to see their buddies. They want to play. They want to, God, Jim would just loved sports and interacting with his buds. He'd, he didn't like going to class, but he loved being with his buds. And so that all tied with it. 
Elected officials who represent parents that are demanding that schools be open and the schools remain closed is, is shocking to me. I never heard New Mexico pro tem Mimi Stewart, Mimi Stewart demand the schools be reopened. Remember, she, remember at the beginning she said, man, I'm an advocate for schools and education. I'm an advocate for our students, our children, for their education. Not a word from her. You gotta ask yourself why, why, why is it? It's clear, the teachers union are spending big bucks for our elected officials that are keeping our schools closed. They're not following the wishes of our parents. They're not following the wishes of the students. They're following the wishes of the teachers union. It's amazing to me. Most telling to me, shocking. I, it wasn't, I wasn't shocked, hugely disappointed. And I, and I have to say that we all know it that President Trump was not the, you know, the, the darling of the teachers' unions. You know, his uh, education secretary, God, she was, she was attacked right and left over it. He was for reopening the schools. Everybody was. But our president, what did that to me, here, was, here is the telling point. Is he saying we're going to make a priority to getting the teachers vaccinated? The teachers are saying, I don't want to get vaccinated. I don't believe in vaccinations. We want to safe schools, but vaccination, maybe not. But the president is pushing to put teachers in front of the elderly, the vulnerable that could be vulnerable of dying from the COVID-19. And he puts the teachers in front of them. When I talk about what is the natural behavior, we get to see it with this, with this COVID-19. And, and, it's, and it's awful that we see where the teachers are coming from. It is about them. It's not about our students. It's about them. It's about our elected officials. And, and it's about them, about them being safe, their financial supporters being safe. When I talk about elitists, elitists are the ones that say, I know what's best for you, I know what's best for your kids, so you need to just sit down and shut up. I've listened on different programs, and what do they do? What do the unions do to shut people down? Elected officials, you don't like to hear what you have to say? Well, you're a racist. Guess what? I, I have been called every different name under the book, been threatened. That's not going to intimidate me to shut up. That's not going to intimidate me to be quiet. It shouldn't allow you to shut your voice down. So we need to go back, we need to take back our schools. We need to make sure that our students and parents are first. We need to go back and make sure that, that the only voice ch chance that uh, parents have uh, to vote up or down on their schools isn't just on the bond issues. And I, and I wanna get back to one thing too about how did APS get so out of whack with the rest of the state? And it's real clear. The teachers union and the teacher funding and all of that, what do they do? They volunteer to elect members of the school board that will support their positions. And what are their positions? More teacher pay, more teacher more teachers, higher pay, better facilities, all of those things. They're not looking and not hold teachers accountable. Remember, that's why we changed the standards again. We don't want to hold our teachers accountable for our students' failures. 
this is what's going on. So we're going to have to take our schools back. And we're going to do it in a couple different ways. You can do it in a couple different ways. Number one is the next school board election, get involved, volunteer, contribute, encourage other people to run other than the ones that are in the pocket of big education. And I guess that's what we should call it. We, hear, we talk about big business, we talk about big labor, we need to talk about big education because it, big education steps on our kids, steps on our parents. The other thing to do is we need to then, if we can't take our schools back and give the control to the parents, is that we need to walk away. And we need to make sure that we allow our parents to take their tax dollars and go somewhere else to educate their kids. Because right now they're not getting funding. And I, as an individual, wonder why is it that I am not allowed why aren't my tax dollars being decreased half? Because schools aren't open. What am I getting for my dollar? There's no bang for the buck. That's what we need to do. I'm excited. I, this is a point that people are up in arms, that they're demanding their schools open, and they're not open. The president has put the teachers in front of the elderly, the vulnerable. We need to make sure that it's not okay to watch teachers elbow the elderly to the ground. I'm Mick Rich, and this is To The Point. Thank you very much. Across the middle, and it's caught. Malik Phillips dancing away. In the first half, he's been under pressure all the game anyway. Smith back to pass. They're trying to set up the screen to Barker, and they've got blockers in front. Barker cuts it back. Barker in the open wow. field. 40, 45, oh 50. Barker's got one man to beat. Barker may go to the house, and he will. Caden Barker huh. touched Jordan Barker. Touchdown, Carlsbad. But here we go. Let's see how he does. Cabrales will kick off from the 40 and drives it hard. And here they he try to see that reverse again. He fakes it. Oh, so he's got it. He's, yeah. he's got one man to beat and a blocker in front. 35, 40, 50, he's, 45. He's, he's gone. The There's no corner that will catch him. Opening kickoff return for Slade Campos. 80 yards and. Falls for Nava, puts it forward for Moyers. Moyers gets it past the keeper, and it's two to one. Denard all by himself. They're looking for him. They throw it in the end zone. Underthrown and caught. How about that? Mercy. Trevon Denard. <laughs> Wow. It's his night. It's his night. What's <laughs> up? Uses that foot. No, this time she goes low. And there's a scrum there. The ball's loose. And it's up and it's in. How about that? Going top shelf. Good dump. And then a... Good wherewithal to keep it up. There's Jones on a good dig. Martinez, Huggins was blocked into a middle. Kept alive and then dumped back over. Let's keep playing, girls. Cross court this time from Cooperno. Jones sets to the outside. McIntosh was blocked. That's knocked back over. We'll continue the rally. Cooper on the right hand. Back row and... McIntosh, a little miscommunication with Lucero. Let's see if that fires up these Cougars. Seventeen, Harris has some time. No one looking. Harris fires on the move, and it's complete. Slipping one, it's Webskowski and another, and it's a foot race. Shot out of a cannon. Justin Webskowski, can he take it all the way? Touchdown.
the Jaguars. There's Smith again, cuts it back. Nice run by Smith, still on his feet, going to the end zone, touchdown. Harris with the fake pitch, and now a run to the outside, and he's got some room. Nice move, Harris, look out. He's across the 40, a cut to midfield. He's got a blocker in front. Look out, chance, Harris, shot out of a cannon, and he's going to take it all the way. Touchdown. Welcome back to The Point with Mick Rich. In this segment, I want to, we talk about how to improve New Mexico. And, and this ties in with education, but in a whole different, kind of a different realm, kind of about how we got here, but what we need to do different. And, and I don't know if you're a real, President Roosevelt was a, is a darling of the Democratic Party. President Roosevelt was a darling to organized labor. He was their supporter across the board. But also what people don't realize is President Roosevelt recognized the dangers that public unions presented to the republic. And he did not support and he believed in banning public employee unions. And New Mexico was a prime example of why he, uh, he opposed, uh, why he opposed public, public unions. And, and I got it. I, I got that at an early age. I remember reading, uh, studying in high school about public unions in the city of San Francisco. And this, so we're going back 120 years and, and we're talking about issues today, but it's about issues that we're not the first ones that face these concerns, these issues. In San Francisco did at the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And what was happening was that the public employees union uh, were supporting, they would get their, their, their members to, to come out and support city council members. And they would not only uh, do grassroots campaigning on behalf of those, those officials, but they would also contribute money. Those individuals would get elected to office. They would support the public employees with increased wages increased uh, number of workers. As you can well imagine, you have now more public employees with more money. You have more public employees. The union's getting bigger. So they have more money to spend to, to elect officials. And we're saying, remember we say, you're in the pocket, you know, you're in the pocket of whatever. This is how it got started. And this thing progressed and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just, and, and I talked about this, we talked about it in uh, a couple shows back, Galloping Gertie, the bridge up in Tacoma Narrows that came down with an oscillation. And the bridge just, the gust wind gust just finally took the bridge down. And it wasn't great large bridge uh, wind gusts but it was that oscillation. Well, guess what? This is what happened. More money to the unions, more money to, to elect officials. Those officials were in the pocket of, of labor, organized labor, big labor, and it kept going bigger and bigger. And it was getting to the point that all the money in San Francisco wasn't going for facilities. It wasn't going for services. It was there to pay the public employees. And there was no way to break the cycle. 
and we're going to get back and talk about how they broke the cycle. So I'm going to talk about how we got to this. We just shared how it happened in San Francisco. Now we're going to talk about New Mexico. Bill Richardson came to New Mexico, and he realized that we were ripe for the picking, and, and boy, were we. Uh, nobody's seen anybody like the likes of Bill Richardson before and since. And he went from congressman to U.S. cabinet secretary to New Mexico governor. And it was clear to me he had his sights set on the White House. He knew the path that he had a, a checklist that he needed. Congressman, cabinet secretary, governor, run for, run for presidency. And he got that. He got chummy with uh, Bill Clinton, uh, President Clinton and his group. Uh, and he was on his way when he got elected to the governor's off to, to the governor's position. Here he is. He's sworn in, and he's got a game plan. He is so. Here it is, and I'm going to run through that checklist that I I would imagine a checklist that he had, and we're going to go through that checklist as if this is Bill Richardson's, but this is my idea of what his checklist was: visionary, spaceport. Do you want a quarter of a billion dollars? He got it. He nailed it. The country can see he is a visionary. Urbanist. Mass tra you can't be more urbanist than mass transit, and we got the rail runner. Now, if you're in New York, you can't see the empty rail runner running back and forth. But what you will hear is that Bill Richardson was an urbanist, and he's, we spent... Bill spent a billion dollars of our money on the rail runner. An environmentalist. How do you do that? Well, 20% renewables for electrical generation. That probably costs us a few billion. Labor organizer. He recognized the Public Employees Union. That was one of the first things he did. We're going to recognize the Public Employees Union. And man, he got grassroots he got a ready. He got an army ready to march on him, for him, and that cost us probably a billion. And he's a labor activist. And you're saying how uh, labor activist? What's the difference between labor organizer and labor activist? Labor organizer is you organize and brought the union in. Well, he he did it with the stroke of a pen. Nobody voted. Nobody said yes or no. He just did it. And a labor activist. Well, he increased the public employees union uh, dramatically in the state of New Mexico. He just went on a hiring binge and hired more public employees. I believe right now uh, that we have more public employee, you know, so public employee unions have gained in strength since Bill Richardson's tenure. We now have substantially more public employee union per capita than almost every state in the United. That to me was just quite remarkable that the surrounding states have close, you know, it just unreal to me how many that we have. And then they all contribute, they're, they, re, they contribute to their union. And those union supporters elect officials that support their unions. That's how APS got their, their board that organized labor that came out, funded, supported them, spent the money. How did we get President Biden? The unions came out 100%. I, did, did President Trump make huge mistakes? Yeah, darn right. Uh, but how did we get President Biden? I believe it was that he had the unions come 100% behind him. And then uh, how, did, how did the teachers get President Biden to make them a priority for vaccinations? Plain and simple, money. Money. Lots of money and lots of people in the unions with their money, their voice, and willing to walk the streets handing out literature 
And that's what's happened. It's killed our education system. It's killing our state. We are spending money for employees. You know, I, I read an article in the Albuquerque Journal and they said, we don't have enough money in the pension fund to ensure that the fund will be there in 120 years. First of all, I thought, most likely, uh, you know, there's enough money there because we've got money there for people that haven't even come to work for the state. But the other one was, we, if we don't have enough money in the pension fund to cover the people that we have working for us, then we have too many people working for us. And the state needs to reduce reduce the number of state employees so the state employees match the pension obligations. And that needs to be accomplished. So you're wondering, how did San Francisco break the cycle? It's an awful story. You may even thought about it when you thought about the time frame. Late 1800s, early 1900s. The San Francisco earthquake. The earthquake came, knocked the buildings down, the fire came behind, burned it to the ground, and they had to start over. That's what we talk about, upsetting the apple cart in a huge, ugly way. Uh, just a side note, my grandfather was attending Stanford University during that time, during the earthquake. He was trapped in a dormitory. Uh, we, my mother would tell the story about her father uh, waiting to get dug out during the dormitory, yeah. while he was buried in the building. His roommate died that was next to him. He, he came out of the earthquake. He was in the hospital, traction for a broken back. So we learned that lesson growing up, just what to do in disasters, how to handle ourselves, but also the lessons learned. So how are we gonna break the cycle? Number one is it's not gonna be easy. We've gotten this far. They've got so much strength behind them. They are just trampling our students. We got to get to the point to say we had enough. Let's start with education. Let's start with education and say I've had enough. The teachers are standing, knocking our, our elderly to the side so they can get a vaccinated first. Our teachers are hanging out, our public employee Teachers are hanging out at home while private teachers are going to school teaching at no, no hazard and say we're, we're going to start with the teachers union and it's got to end there. We've got we've to elect the next governor that believes that our state and you are the most important person in the state, not the employees. So, I want to thank you for tuning in. Next week, I'm going to put up a map on where I went and some of the photographs because I think it's important that we never forget. We're the land of enchantment. We've got great natural resources, blue skies, open spaces. I'm Mick Rich, and welcome to The Point.